So now we're getting to constant pressure calorimetry, which is what we're going to do in lab today. So a coffee cup calorimeter is just what the name suggests. It's a calorimeter made out of a coffee cup, a styrofoam coffee cup. We use two cups because we get better insulation that way. This is open to the atmosphere. It doesn't have an airtight seal on it. Even if it did, the styrofoam would just break if you got too much pressure. So we have constant pressure. So here's an illustration. We've got two nested styrofoam cups and we've got the reactants in here and they're going to be in a solution. This doesn't work for measuring the heat given off by the combustion of sugar or something, right? Because that's going to give off too much energy and it's going to actually melt and burn the styrofoam. Um, all of these reactions are going to be aqueous. They're going to be happening in water. So we can measure the temperature change for the solution. We can measure the mass of the solution. We can measure or look up the specific heat capacity of the solution. And so we can calculate the amount of heat that the solution either gains or loses, which is Q equals MC delta T. So we're looking at the solution, the surroundings of the reaction. Q for the reaction is equal to Q for the solution, but opposite in sign. Q for the reaction is Q at constant pressure, which is delta H. Delta H for reaction is typically expressed in kilojoules per mole. And so to get per mole, we're going to figure out, take the mass of our reactants and convert it to moles and then divide. And so this is exactly the thing that we're going to be doing in, in lab today. So here's an example. The addition of hydrochloric acid to a silver nitrate solution precipitates silver chloride according to the reaction, blah, blah, blah. When 50 milliliters of 0.1 molar silver nitrate is combined with 50 milliliters of 0.1 molar HCl in a coffee cup calorimeter, the temperature changes from 23.4 degrees Celsius to 24.21 degrees Celsius. Calculate delta H for the reaction as written. Use one gram per milliliter as the density of the solution and specific heat capacity of 4.18 joules per gram this degree Celsius. So they're telling us what to use. We're going to need the density um, because we're given amounts, volumes, and we need masses and eventually moles. Okay, so what do we have here? So we have um, an initial temperature, that's what? From 23. And the final temperature, it went to 24.21 degrees Celsius. So we can calculate the change in the temperature, delta T, 24.21, the final, minus the initial, Zero point eight one degrees Celsius. They told me what the specific heat capacity was. They said use four point one eight joules per gram degree Celsius. The equation, the place to start for all of these sorts of calculations is Q equals MC delta T. I'm trying to find delta H. Delta H for the reaction is equal to Q for the reaction, which is minus Q for the solution. I've got the temperature change for the solution. I've got the specific heat capacity for the solution. What else do I need? 
I need the mass of the solution. You didn't tell me the mass. Yeah? Which part? This part up here? So um, at constant pressure, Q is equal to the change in enthalpy for the reaction, <coughs> delta H. <coughs> Yes, this is a Q. Does that not look like a Q? I'll try again. Is that better? Q? Q equals MC delta T. So I need the mass. If they give me the density, do I know the total volume of the solution? What is it? It's 100 milliliters, right? So I have 50 milliliters of one and 50 milliliters of the other. So I've got 50 milliliters plus 50 milliliters. Whoops. So that's 100.0 milliliters. And I need that as a mass. So I can use the density to convert. I want grams on top and milliliters on the bottom, so those cancel. And it's 1.00 grams per one milliliter. And we end up with 100 grams. And you're like, well, that was a dumb calculation. Sometimes it is, and sometimes it isn't. But there's my mass. So this is equal to my mass. So now I can calculate Q for the solution. That's the mass of the solution, 100.0 grams, times the specific heat capacity for the solution, times the change in temperature for the solution, so 338.58. And the unit there is joules, right? Because the grams cancel and the degrees Celsius cancel. So Q solution is positive. How do I know it's positive? Well, I did the temperature change correctly. The, it has to be final minus initial. If it gets colder, the final is lower and you'll get a negative delta T. And that's how you'll end up with a negative Q. So you have to do that delta thing in the right direction. So the solution gained energy, it went up in temperature. So the reaction lost energy. So Q for the reaction then is equal to negative Q for the solution. So negative 338.58 joules. And if we're thinking about significant figures, it should be 2. So that's the amount of energy given off by this specific quantity of substances. But the question says, for the reaction as written. Well, the reaction as written has how many moles of silver nitrate? One. And how many moles of HCl? One. So I need to relate this to one mole of silver nitrate. Well, how many moles of silver nitrate did I use here? Can I calculate that? Question? Negative? Because um, the reaction is opposite in sign to the solution. Okay. The solution is the surroundings, and the reaction is the system. So that becomes the solution? Well, we measured the solution. And so we know that if the sol solution, which is the surroundings, gained this, then the reaction must have lost that. Oh, okay. Yeah. 
because we can't measure that directly. We can only measure the effect of it. So I need to figure out how many moles of stuff I had here. So I've got 0 0.0500 liters, which is converting milliliters to liters, times 0 0.100 moles per liter. And so that's 0 0.00500 moles of silver nitrate. I've got the same volume, the same concentration of the other reactant. So that's also 0 0.00500 moles. So I could look at either one of these. It's going to be the same because they are the same. I don't have a limiting reactant here and we're not gonna do that to you, okay? This is hairy enough. So to get this in moles, I'm sorry, joules per mole, delta H for the reaction is minus 338.58 joules divided by the number of moles. So six seven seven one six. Do you think joules is the best unit for the energy there? That's a really big number, right? The 67,000 joules, a thousand joules is a kilojoule. We could convert that to kilojoules. Um, and so up here, the best answer would be delta H reaction. Oh, I lost my minus sign. That's very sloppy. Minus. Delta H is going to be a negative because Q is negative. So putting this into um, kilojoules and rounding it, it's going to be minus 68 kilojoules. And we could write per mole, but it's per molar amount in here. Any questions? Yeah. Delta H is almost always expressed in joules or kilojoules per mole. Mm -hmm. um, it could be expressed just as joules, but generally not, because it's generally given in association with the chemical equation, and so we have to relate it to the molar amounts. So typically, delta H is where you would divide by the moles that you used, and that's exactly what we're going to do in lab today. You're going to measure Q for your reaction, and then to find delta H, you're going to divide by the moles of reactant that you used. The reason is we, comparing Qs is not very useful because, well, how much copper sulfate did you have in your cup? Well, I had this much. Well, that's why our numbers are different. So we can't tell if our numbers are good or not. If we divide by the moles of reactant that we used, in theory, we should all come up with the same delta H because that one is not dependent on well, it's expressed in a way that's not dependent on stuff. Any other questions? My question is, will this chapter ever end? Um, in the same, the same reaction with exactly the same amount of reactant is conducted in a bomb calorimeter and in a coffee cup calorimeter. In one of the calorimeters, Q reaction is minus 12.5 kilojoules, and in the other, Q reaction is minus 11.8 kilojoules. Which value was obtained in the bomb calorimeter? Assume that the reaction has a positive delta V in the coffee cup calorimeter. So 
we don't really need to do a calculation, but we do need to think about what's the difference between the coffee cup and the bomb calorimeters. So in the bomb calorimeter, whoops, this is at constant volume, right? And the coffee cup is at constant pressure. So if we're looking at the amount of energy, the, the change in internal energy is Q plus W, and W is minus P delta V. So it's Q plus negative P delta V. Under the right circumstances, delta E is equal to Q. That's true when the change in volume is zero. Okay. Which one of these has delta V equals zero? Which one has constant volume? The bomb. Because it can't change its volume. So delta V equals zero. Here, the change in volume, it says assume the reaction has a positive delta V. So here, delta V is greater than zero. So in the bomb calorimeter, this term goes to zero, and the change in energy is equal to Q. In the coffee cup calorimeter, Q is going to be the same, but then we also have this term, which is uh, negative P delta V, delta V is positive, the pressure is positive, so this term is negative. And so the coffee cup calorimeter is going to have to be the smaller one. So which one is the, the bomb? It's the minus 12.5. Because in the bomb calorimeter, no work is done. In the coffee cup calorimeter, work can be done. Now, is it a huge difference there? 12.5 to 11.8? It's not a really big difference, but it is a difference. So what we measure in the coffee cup calorimeter will typically be smaller than what you would measure in a bomb calorimeter, but most of the time, the difference isn't really important. Any questions? <coughs> 